good morning, church, <clears throat> and all of you that are visiting with us through some sort of electronic transmission. Uh, I'm not a, any kind of a tech guru, so I can't talk in those terms, but thanks for joining us and uh, being a blessing. Uh, <clears throat> before I, I get started in my message, I just want to share with you that um, there's a difference between salvation, being saved, and knowing Jesus as your Lord. And I'm going to touch on that uh, through some of the scripture references that I'm going to give you. So we'll, we'll visit those, and uh, I'll have a, a comment or two on most of the verses, but some of them are pretty straightforward, so it doesn't need a whole lot of explanation. Uh, but in any event, uh, before we start, let's, uh, let's just pray here. Father, we thank you for this time together. Lord, we thank you for your word, because not only is your word truth, you are truth. And uh, Lord, we, we invite you, Holy Spirit, to open the eyes of our understanding, open our hearts to receive truth from you, and, uh, Lord, we just uh, ask you to bless your word uh, as it goes forth today. Amen. Okay, so if you've got, got your Bibles handy, uh, one of the first uh, references that I want to talk about here is from 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 3 to 6. And uh, it's basically talking about um, how we can know uh, that uh, uh, we are saved and uh, how we can know the Lord. So I'm sure that most of you are familiar with this. But uh, let's just start off here with uh, uh, verse 3. And uh, it says, By this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. So now you can see that uh, if you're looking at that in your own Bible or online, uh, you can see that uh, there's the word if in there. And if is always setting you up for a condition, right? That's a conditional promise. So by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So it's being obedient there. And... Uh, Going on to verse 4, it says, Whoever says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly has the love of God perfected in him. And by this we know we are in him. So whoever says he remains in him ought to walk as he walked. So... You know, salvation goes beyond just coming to a place of recognizing you're a sinner and you need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ, of course. It talks about lifestyle as well. It talks about walking as he walked. It talks about walking in the things of God, walking in the Word. And what that's talking about really is lifestyle, church. So can you see that? It's pretty simple stuff here. It just has to be unpacked a little bit. So the next one I want to share with you is uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Now that's kind of a penetrating question that the Lord asks us. But he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? So that, <laughs> I mean, you know, Oftentimes, the Word of God can step all over our toes because we know that we're not doing some of the things that we should be doing. And it's not, see, that's the thing. It's not talking about a legalistic way of applying this, of doing these things. It's talking about responding out of a heart change. It's talking about uh, heartfelt behavior. It's, it's talking about honoring the one that you love. Now, I'm not talking about your spouse, but that's good too. Uh, I'm talking about the Savior. He's Lord. 
He is Lord. So that's pretty simple. I mean, it doesn't take a whole lot of explanation there. So why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? So there's, you know, he's suggesting pretty strongly that there's a type of rebellion in there. If you don't want to do what you're supposed to be doing, you're kind of walking on the edge here, and that's going to be a dangerous place. Okay, so now on to James uh, chapter 1, verse 22. It says, uh, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Um, and, and as a result of that, in verse uh, 25, you'll be blessed in your deeds. So there's a connection there between God's blessing for us and being obedient to what he tells us to do. Um, and God's word isn't grievous because, you know, when your heart is changed, uh, when you get saved, scripture tells us that all things become new. So this is really becoming who you are. And uh, uh, anything, anything other than that it says that we're kind of living, uh, living a lie or a pretense. So, um, okay, on to First Peter five five, and he says, uh, "Be submissive to one another, and clothe yourselves with humility, because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble." Pride means I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. So, you know, there's no room in there for our God uh, or his word or his principles. And, uh, you know, there's a place in scripture, I believe it's in Proverbs, it says that the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. You know, if, we, if we're rejecting God's word uh, in terms of the things that are supposed to be uh, touched in our lives, then there's no grace there. Uh, we're functioning in the flesh. And the flesh is something that we have to crucify. And it seems that that has to be done over and over again. Even though we have a, a sin nature and... And uh, we're not sinners because we sin. Uh, we sin because we're sinners, right? We're redeemed by grace, but there's still that nature there. So, and that thing wants to poke its head up on occasion and give us a little heartburn. So, okay, so then just in connection with that, uh, I want to tell you that holiness is the product of grace and humility. Grace means God does it, right? God does things in our lives. By grace, you have been saved. We didn't save ourselves. Uh, God did that through grace. Grace is God's uh, undeserved favor that he shows towards us. It's also, uh, in the original Greek, talks about uh, it's God's influence on the heart, and that is manifested or revealed or lived out in your life. And you can see how that fits because, uh, again, getting back to uh, that we, we can't save ourselves. It's by grace we are saved. So God changes the heart. With that heart change should come a life change. So all of this is intertwined. Holiness, as we're on this, uh, uh, talks in terms of uh, being separated from sin and consecrated to God. Um, sin... In the original Greek talks about it's it's actually an archery term and it means missing the mark so you can be on the target but you're not in the bullseye and that's the mark so sin is anything and everything even thoughts thought of sin is sin so it's it's a result of uh, living life the way I want to live that and whether you know I I asked somebody one time you know, how are you doing and so on. And yeah, they were they, were, they gave me a report uh, and I said, well, my goodness, uh, uh, that's what the Bible calls sin. He said, well, it's not sin. It's just what I do. Well, yes, but uh, sin is the thing that separates us from a loving God. 
Okay, so now the next verse I want to share with you is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. And it says, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. So, you know, I mean, if you have a job, uh, you're in the world. But we're not supposed to be part of that world process or the world's values. Um, we have to uh, do things that, that uh, cause us to uh, be involved in, in uh, world uh, orders and, and values. But we don't have to accept those as our own. So he says, come out from among them. Who is them? Well, that's all of those that, that uh, are friends with the world, right? They, they embrace the world's values. Uh, well, you know, are you saying, Charles, that that, uh, that means I can't have uh, uh, friends who are not Christians? No, I'm not talking about that. But you should not be embracing their value system. Can you see the difference there? So we're to be separated from them, says the Lord. And don't touch what they're touching. Don't touch those unclean things. Now, it's not talking about with your hands. Uh, it's talking about don't even embrace that in your thoughts. Don't even embrace that in your desires. Um, yeah, not to touch what is unclean, he says, and I will receive you. So, you know, that's an invitation to intimacy. And intimacy is really uh, living closely with the Lord. It's close friendship. Okay, so let's go on to uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 1 and verse 3. So verse 1 says, Therefore, put away all wickedness, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. If it is true that you have experienced that the Lord is good. So there's a condition there. So he's really saying, if you've experienced, if you're saved, you've experienced that the Lord is good, then you should be putting away all kind, every form of wickedness, every form of deceit, whether it's thinking, whether it's behavior, whether it's hypocrisy, right? Um, doing one thing, saying, saying you, you believe one thing and you're doing just the absolute opposite. Uh, envy. Why are you envying what the world has? Since when has the world been right? I mean, my goodness. Uh, look around you and check tomorrow's headlines. You'll see the world system is not right. That's why one of the reasons that we're in the mess we're in. One of the reasons. So he says, put all of that stuff away if indeed it is true that you have experienced that the Lord is good. Okay, so we need to live as if we really are God's servants. And uh, uh, one of the scriptures that talks about that is uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses uh, 14 to 16. So just let me read that here. He says, As obedient children, do not conduct yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Lusts can all be also be... Uh, uh, translated as desires, but but in this sense, uh, it's really talking about uh, immoral lusts. Uh, and it goes on in verse 15 to say, be holy in all your conduct. Uh, verse 16, be holy for I am holy. This is God speaking. And uh, back to verse 13, he says, therefore, guard your minds, be sober, and sober means not talking about substance abuse. It's talking about being watchful, being free of wrong influence. So we need to set a hedge around ourselves because we know that there's all kinds of voices uh, going on in the world uh, that every day, uh, from every corner, every side, that's vying for our attention. So uh, back to verse 14, he says, uh, As obedient children... Do not conduct yourselves according to the former lust. So I mentioned earlier that, you know, when we get saved, uh, Scripture tells us that all things become new. And uh, that, that includes your thinking. One of the things that becomes new is uh, your spiritual heart. Uh, now, uh, Scripture talks about 
as a person thinks in their heart, that's the way they are. So your heart attitude governs your thinking and your thinking controls uh, your behavior. So those are all things. He says, therefore, guard your minds and uh, be watchful and free of wrong influence. Somebody's telling ugly jokes, dirty jokes, uh, smutty jokes, uh, complaining, murmuring, grumbling. I mean, that's common in most lunchrooms these days. You know what? Just get up and walk away from that because you've, you're defiling yourself uh, when you're sitting under all of that stuff because it's not life. It's actually a form of death. So because it's death because it robs you of spiritual life. Okay, so now, friendship with the world. Uh, I've got a number of verses here from the book of James, chapter 4, uh, verses 4, 7, 8, and 10. So let me just go through that a little bit here. Now, <laughs> this is pretty... James, James is not a guy that tippy-toes around things and, and is known uh, uh, for being uh, uh, sweet and tender with his words. So he's quite, quite penetrating here. He says, you adulterers and adulteresses, uh, do you not know that the friendship with the world is enmity, or in other words, hate, hateful and uh, hatred and, and hostility uh, with God? So let me just stop there a little bit. Now, Adulterers and adulteresses. Now that can talk. That can talk about uh, uh, moral behavior. It can also talk about um, spiritual adultery. Now we say, well, you know what? We don't have any idols here. We're not worshiping idols anymore. Well, listen. I want to tell you, we do, and and they're probably more alive today than they were back in the day that we're reading about here, because. You know, an idol can be absolutely anything. What, what is the thing? What are the things that you think about the most in life? That's in grave danger of being an idol for you. It can be good health, abnormal uh, uh, thoughts about good health. It can be death. It can be bank accounts. It can be living in the right part of town. It can be having a house that just rivals Donald Trump's. Uh, it can be uh, the car that you think is just the best. So an idol is not just uh, worshiping something with 18 uh, arms and, and three heads. You know, it's, uh, it goes beyond that. So it goes on to say, Whoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, that's a pretty hard word here. Uh, you're, you're friendly with the world system. You, you get up in the morning just thinking about... You know, all the stuff that you're going to do that's worldly, you know what? God does not honor that, church. He does not honor that. And we need to know that because uh, staying clean, staying clean before the Lord is also a type of spiritual warfare. It doesn't only uh, have God bless us, hear our prayers. Uh, it's also a type of spiritual warfare. So... Uh, Verse 7, it says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So, there's a two, part, uh, two parts to this uh, verse. First of all, we have to submit to God. You know, when we yield uh, to God's authority, that's submission. I remember, I remember hearing a cute little story one time about, about uh, a father driving down the street and uh, his young son uh, was standing on the seat beside him. And, uh, <clears throat> son, sit down, he said. Uh, no, he didn't want to. So he re-emphasized that and put a little more emphasis on it. And he said, son, sit down. So, no, he wouldn't. So his father stopped the car and spanked him and set him down. And off he went. He was driving down the road again. And, and the little lad said, Daddy, I might be uh, sitting down on the outside, but I'm still standing up on the inside, right? So that's, you know, you don't want, you can do that with God, but I tell you, you'll pay a price for that. And uh, we need to know that going in so there's no surprises, right? Uh, if, if you're the opposite to submission is really rebellion. 
that means doing my thing when I want to do it, whenever I want to do it. And don't anybody try to stop me on that. So, Scripture says that the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. Now, I don't know about you. I, I don't think we're talking about some Hawaiian vacation here on a nice sunny beach, right? Uh, I think that's talking about some uh, hard, hard uh, uh, learning curves in here. A sun-scorched land. So, draw near to God. He will draw near to you. So it's a two-way street. See, that's talking about um, relationships. It's talking about fellowship. It's talking about friendships. Uh, so if we draw near to God, uh, and that's it all has to start church in your heart. Uh, it's not a mental thing. Uh, and not, it's not a, uh, something that you can work up in your head. Uh, it's all about uh, your, your heart condition. And it uh, goes on to say, cleanse your hands, purify your hearts. So cleansing your hands, you know, we hear a lot about that these days with this COVID-19. Well, that's a different kind of hand cleansing. Cleansing your hands in Scripture is always a type and a picture of what are you doing with your hands, right? What are the things you're doing in life? It talks about your feet. Uh, where are you going? What are the things you're doing when you think nobody is watching you? What are the things you're doing from Monday to Friday or Saturday uh, and you're completely different on Sunday, right? That's convicting, church, and it's supposed to be. Okay. Uh, and verse 10, uh, he says, Humble yourself in the Lord's sight and he will lift you up. So God honors a heart that's soft and pliable in God's hands. In fact, uh, I think it's Psalm, uh, I stand to be corrected here, it's either Psalm 37 uh, or 34, something like that. It says, um, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Trust also in him and he will bring them to pass, right? Um, that word delight in the original Hebrew is talking about be soft and pliable in God's hands. Don't resist him. You can be rebellious. Uh, you can stand up for what you want to do. Uh, but you know what, church? Uh, all that happens there is heartache. There's a price to pay in all of that. Yeah. So humble yourselves in the Lord's sight, and he will lift you up or exalt you. Uh, okay, so now. The tongue... And speech. Well, uh, we're going to go to James chapter 3, uh, verses 5 to 12. And I'm going to find that in my Bible here. You're all familiar with this. You've heard this before. So, starting out in verse 5 here, he says, Even so, the tongue is a little part of the body and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. The tongue is a fire, a world of evil. The tongue is among the parts of the body, defiling the whole body, and setting the course of nature on fire. And it is set on fire by hell. Now, just, just a word here. Um, you know, Scripture tells us that out of the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, the words you're speaking come from an attitude. And that attitude is birthed, first of all, in your heart. Uh, and then in your mind, and then it becomes action. So, as we heard earlier, guard your heart. Guard your thoughts. So, let's just read on here. Uh, All kinds of beasts and birds and serpents and things in the sea are tamed or have been tamed by mankind. But 
No man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. I mean, I'm telling you, I have heard some people use salty language that they could take the wallpaper off the wall, right? I, you know what? That church is all part of what's going on in your heart. And I can almost guarantee that when uh, ungodly speech comes out of your mouth, whether it's profanity, whether it's smut, whether it's anger, there's an issue in your heart that needs to get dealt with. Um, there's an unresolved matter there that the Lord wants to put his finger on. Um, okay, let's continue on here. Uh, with it, the tongue, we bless the Lord and Father, and with, with it we curse men who are made in the image of God. Can you see that? Uh, and out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. Right? I mean, with the same mouth we eat, with the same mouth you want to kiss your kids goodnight and bless them. How do you do that? I mean, uh, my brothers, these things not ought to be so. Does a spring yield at the same time uh, and from the same opening sweet and bitter water? Can the fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or vine, uh, or a vine rather, or figs? Uh, so no spring, no spring can yield both salt water and fresh water. So from your regenerated man, uh, from your heart, from the, the part of you that's born again, if it's truly born again, and you're still talking the way you did when you frequented the pool hall, or skinned your knuckles when you were fixing your car, something's wrong. That should not be. Okay. But the wisdom that is from above... Uh, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. No pretense. It's sincere. And in fact, it's interesting. The word sincere comes from the old French word. It talks about, uh, it really, if you break it down, it means sans sire. Sans means without. Sire means wax. So the back of the day, uh, people used to sell crack pottery as if it was good. So what they do is hide the cracks with a little bit of wax on it. So now, applying that to this passage, be real, church. Come on, be real. Uh, don't don't uh, be pretentious. Uh, don't act one way on Sunday and another way the rest of the week. So uh, have your heart cleaned up. So, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So that's good. That was, that's a good exhortation in itself there. Um, so now, on to the works of the flesh. Now, all of you, I'm sure, have read this at one time or another. So let's just uh, revisit this in uh, Galatians chapter 5. So we're talking about, uh, starting at uh, verse 16, and going on to, uh, what, verse 26, it says, uh, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So, you know, if you're walking in a godly way, if you're, a, if you're reading God's Word on a regular basis... And I'm not talking about regularly every Christmas or Easter. I'm talking about regular, deliberate, daily reading of God's Word. And you don't have to read volumes of it. Read a little. That's one of the ways that you get to know who your God is. That's one of the ways you get to see His promises. And it's one of the ways that uh, you grow in the Lord. So... Uh, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the desires of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, 
and the spirit against the flesh. So there's a war going on there. So you can't, I, you know what? I believe that the most miserable Christian is one that's trying to walk in both area, both arenas of life. I mean, you end up walking like you got dirty diapers, right? I mean, you're going in this camp and that camp. What does that profit? I mean, there's nothing there. So, so now he goes on to say, but if you're led by the spirit, you are not under the law, right? And uh, now, in verse 19, he says, Now the works of the flesh are revealed, <clears throat> Excuse me. which are these, adultery, sexual immorality, immorality rather, impurity, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, sorcery, sorcery is uh, witchcraft, and the Bible says that, <clears throat> excuse me, that witchcraft um, is projecting your own desires uh, into a situation. So hatred, strife, jealousy, rage, selfishness, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. Now you can see there's a whole, there's a whole ton of stuff here. I uh, he said, I warn you, as I previously warned you, that those who do these things, now listen to this. Those who do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, now, wait a minute. That's pretty serious. Uh, you mean to say if I do that once, I'm, I'm in trouble? You know, church, listen. If we do it once, twice, we need to repent of that and turn from it. But this is talking about a lifestyle of that, right? Uh, if you tell somebody that's doing these kinds of things that sin, they'll say, no, no, that's just... That's just who I am. That's just my lifestyle. So we need to know what God says about this. People's opinions uh, are okay when it comes to selecting pink socks or green socks, but not when it comes to God's word. And he goes on to say here that, but the fruit of the Spirit, which is completely opposite now from the works of the flesh, but the fruit of the Spirit is, most of you can quote this, it's love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. So those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh. Did you hear that? That's key. Those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Right? So now you say, yeah, well, you know, Lord, Oh, you did all that in the cross for me. I don't have to do anything here. Well, I'm not sure. How come you're still continuing in that? So I believe that that life and the Christian life uh, is like an onion where we, uh, you know, you peel off a layer and there's still onion left there. So you get down to this wee little thing. <clears throat> well, life is like that. The Christian life is like that. There's a, there's a refining process. Um, uh, sometimes, uh, I remember years and years ago, I used to uh, be a competitive uh, uh, handgun shooter. And I used to cast my own bullets. And I, the lead that I got was not very good lead. So I had to heat the stuff up and, and uh, uh, throw a little flux into it and get it to the right temperature where all of the impurities would come off. And then I'd skim them off. And, and the way you knew that you were at the right temperature and it was clean, is that you'd look in there and you'd see your reflection. So, you know, church, listen, uh, the Christian walk is not unlike that. Uh, we need to have an ear tuned to channel three uh, to see what the Lord is saying to our hearts. And we have to invite him to do that. You have to sit quietly. You know, you can't live riotously and expect the Lord to speak to you. He can do that, but that's not common, right? So we need to position ourselves by cleaning up the things in our lives that we know we have to clean up. How do we do that? Well, you know what? You can't do it. Well, then what are you talking about here, Charles? Well, I'm saying that God's grace. Remember, I told you earlier that, that grace is really... Uh, God's influence on your heart and that revealed in your life. So you invite the Lord into those areas of your life. Be, 
you allow him to go through the doors that are locked where you're hiding all kinds of stuff in there you think nobody knows about. But you know what? Here's the deal. The question is, when are you in trouble? When you do something wrong or when you get caught? Right? Most people would say when you get caught. That's not the answer. You're in trouble the minute you do something wrong because God sees all of that, right? He says, I see all of the evil, the good and the evil in the world. So you want to get that right with God, you invite him into those areas and say, Lord, I can't do this. I'm, I'm fed up with this. I've had enough. I'm done. I give you permission to come into those areas and deliver me from that. Give me a new heart in that area. So, that's part of the program there. Those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh. You'll have to, you chose to do things. You can't ask God to take it away. You chose to do things. You have to choose to give those things up. You have to choose to put those on the cross. Right? We're not far out of, from, from the uh, uh, Easter season here. So, you know, church, one of the things that you can do uh, if the Lord is putting a finger on something in your life, uh, you can say, Lord, I purpose in my heart to put these things on the cross of Jesus Christ. I put them to death there. And I invite you to resurrect newness in my life in that area. So it's something just that simple, church. Um, so let's not be conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. So we're called to separate ourselves. I just have uh, uh, another couple of items here, and then I'm going to pray with you. Uh, the next one is from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verses uh, 14 to 17. Okay. And... Uh, he goes on to say, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, I mentioned earlier that, is it wrong to have friends who are not Christians? No. I mean, how else are you going to influence them, right? How, how else are you going to show them uh, truth, uh, God's love, uh, and that there's a way out of all of the issues that they're involved in? Uh, but so do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion has light with darkness? Now we're talking about spiritual light and spiritual darkness there. Uh, what agreement has Christ with Belial or demonic things? Or what part has he who believes with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Now, temple of God, you, if you're a believer, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? So that's what this is talking about. For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will live in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, listen to this, simple, therefore, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. There's lots of keys in there. You're not supposed to be messing around in the stuff that the world messes in. If you are, God's not going to answer. He's not going to hear you. Uh, Psalm says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear my prayers. So, don't touch the stuff that God says, don't touch. And uh, so we're to come out from among them and be separate. Yeah, well, Lord, those are my friends. Those are my friends. God will give you new friends, church. Come on. We need to know uh, what this is all about and, and uh, who we are here. So, okay. So now, uh, Psalm 103, verse 7. Mm -hmm. 
This is a simple little verse. I'm telling you, you can almost miss this when you're reading the word. It says, this is a psalm written by David. Uh, and he said, uh, talking about uh, Moses, he said, He, God, made known his ways, God's ways, to Moses. His acts to the people of Israel. Now, the name Moses means drawn out. Uh, he was drawn out of the Nile by Pharaoh's uh, daughter or her handmaidens. So that's one sense of being drawn out. So, but also Moses was drawn out of all kinds of worldly and ungodly stuff. So consequently, he made known his ways. What's the difference between God's ways and his acts? God showed Moses God's heart, right? He showed Moses the way he was supposed to go. He showed Moses the heartbeat of God. But to the Israelites, that God said continually that they were a hard-hearted, stiff-necked, rebellious generation, he just showed them his acts, right? Well, I want to know God's ways. And when you get to know somebody's ways, church, I want to tell you, you're walking pretty closely with them. So you have friends that will confide in you. You have friends that you can confide in. You, they know your ways and you know their ways. That's a close friendship. So that's it. We're done. Uh, thanks for being gracious and uh, attentive. And let's, let's just pray into this a short prayer. And uh, just bow with me. Father, we tell you that living the way we want to live is not really what we want to do. And we know that because we're hardwired to worship you, to live for you. And if we don't, we have to worship something. And that something will be an idol of some sort. So, Father, we tell you that we invite you into those areas of our lives to bring deliverance, to bring healing, to do a work of grace in our hearts that we desire to do your will, to walk in your ways, to honor you. Because we are meant to be blessed and to be a blessing to those around us. And if we're not living right, we turn out to be hypocrites. And people know that. So, Father, we invite you into those areas and give us the grace, Lord, to crucify those areas of the flesh that need to be put away. And we thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.